Disclaimer. The views expressed in this video are my opinions. I ask everyone to pick up this book if they wish to form their own. What I like, others may not, and so on. On to the review. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I've made a horrible mistake. After the trash fire that was Nightbane, I thought I would take a break and just pick up something off the bestseller list. The first thing I saw was a sequel. Being the autist that I am, I grabbed the first book. I'd never heard of the series before and thought it might be safe. I quickly realized that was a terrible mistake. I'm going to quickly pitch my art contest, then continue. I'm having a pinup art contest for all you artists online. To enter, just do what you normally do. Draw a pinup. It can be of any character you like. The winners will be hired for the promotional art for my next book. Each commission is $200, and the deadline is December 15th. Follow the link in the description to the video with the details. Back to the review. This week we're reviewing Fourth Wing. It turns out this book is rather infamous, and it was bad luck that I didn't know about it. Well, I bought it. It's through a major publisher. So I'm about to do like an old man and tell you everything I thought about it. Just so you know where we stand, let's start with the story. Violet Sorengale, and this is the only time I'm going to use her last name, is the smallest, weakest, and most easily broken woman in a family full of military women. She is currently arguing with General Mommy. It's less an argument and more a, no daughter of mine is going to be a book fairy. Get your diminished cheeks to the Dragon Rider trials, and if you don't, I'll drag you there myself kind of conversation. Violet's sister Mira is also there, and she's doing all of Violet's arguing for her. The argument goes nowhere because Mommy runs the military and has a dragon the size of a B-52. So off to the rider trials we go. This isn't before Mira strips her sister of everything she owns and gives her special armor and shoes to help her survive the trials. After losing 75% of her stuff and dressing like a fantasy fetish girl, Violet is sent off to the trials that has about a 15-20% to mortality rate. Mira tells her not to make friends, but Violet starts as she means to go on by not listening to anyone's advice. The first thing they have to do is climb a couple hundred feet of stairs. Violet chucks her sister's advice right out the window and starts making friends. Two of the people around her are in for it, and one is comic relief that, and by that I mean he's Disney evil, like he's what Disney would consider Disney evil. Violet sees that the girl of her group has bad shoes on, and so trades one of her own, because she's stupid. They reach the top of the tower, and we find love interest A is standing there as some kind of proctor. Violet was especially warned to stay away from this guy, so naturally, she won't. Now it's time for the real first trial crossing a smooth stone bridge with no handrails. And hey look, it started to rain and the wind is blowing, and the guy she made friends with who started to cross before her falls off and dies. Oh wait, he was about to get married, oh no! Don't worry, this is the first death of many. Disney villain is angry, so Violet starts to cross. She's really slow about it and at one point falls to her knees. Disney villain gets upset and starts throwing people off the bridge to get to her so he can throw her off the bridge. Violet dashes across and pulls out a knife and holds it level with his crotch and threatens to literally emasculate the Disney villain. And that's where I'm going to leave off with the story. I'm going to cover my likes first because if I don't, I'm going to forget. The world, at least as presented in the beginning, almost threatens to be interesting. There's the possibility for complex interspecies politics, the magic system is complex and could be interesting, and I like the idea of militarizing dragons. Likes out of the way, let's get on to my dislikes. You can forget everything above that I mentioned, because this is fairy porn. More accurately, it's romanticy, or so I have been informed. I should have known something was wrong from the first paragraph. There's something specific about this genre. While they're willing to put in all the other fantasy elements, of dragons and magic and scribes, they aren't willing to purple up the prose. Fantasy is a genre where I expect some antique language, even just more formal dialogue. The author threw the word thrice at the first chapter the same way you put a single piece of parsley on a steak and call it a salad. After that, it was an avalanche of modern speak and cursing. 
Lots of cursing, too. It's even in the narration. This book is written in a tight-ish first person, and it's the main character narrating. This means she curses all the time. She curses for emphasis. She curses for adjectives. And sometimes she just curses to curse. She also does it for the pause for realization moments, none of which you hadn't figured out by the first chapter. Let's rag on the narration a little bit more. I don't know what it is about romanticy authors and this type of narration, but they use it to make things that should be quick and easy long and drawn out affairs. We spend a lot of time on internal monologue and a bit of history and what everybody is saying, like with the meeting with her mother. The whole thing sounds like it should have taken less than five real world minutes, but it feels like we're knocking on an hour before she gets to the hallway. Don't worry, the problem is fixed by the end of the book where the author is machine gunning stuff at you with no end. I don't remember much from the last battle, but to be fair, I was bored to the point of falling asleep. There's also weird stuff that happens with the narration too, like when her dragon who can read her mind hears her giving exposition, adding a rather pointless fourth wall break. Moving on to the plot. There was a chance for a complex plot with multiple characters from fairly interesting backgrounds going to Dragon Death School, and just trying to survive it. What we got was two popular boys fighting over the main character, and Psycho White Boy trying to kill her. That and the all-too-frequent cringy adult scenes that are preceded by the usual pronouncements that sound like the most insufferable relationship imaginable. Every cadet at this school is in their 20s. I remember what it was like to be in my 20s, and there's really not that much talk associated with adult activities. Before you go thinking this is Hogwarts University Triple X, you've got to wade through all the show, don't tell. Or in this case, tell, don't show. Violet has classes and challenges. What are the classes like? Well, there's one on military updates, and then I honestly don't remember, and I don't care enough to go dig through the hormones. The challenges were a chance for the book to finally get interesting. Violet is diminished physically from a disease her mother had while pregnant. She's small, thin, and easily broken. She's so fragile that falling once requires her to wrap her knee for several days. How does she cope? Well, first we have some plot convenience. Her sister, Mira, got her the list of who's challenging her each week, which is outright cheating. Then, Violet poisons them before the match. More outright cheating. She times it so the poison, whatever it is, kicks in at the beginning of the fight so she can beat them up. This is okay because of the rules. Quick side tangent. It's stated at the beginning that the Dragon Riders are almost ruleless due to the danger of their job and the difficulty getting them to follow anything. This would be a cool little detail if they stuck with it. But there are rules. They only seem to apply when Violet has been written into a corner or needs to be shown to be smarter than her opponents. Back to ragging on the plot. Here's where I'm going to get spoilerish. So if I haven't completely turned you off to the book and you still want to read it, you can turn off the review here. When it comes time to get their dragons, Violet doesn't get just the biggest and baddest dragon of all times, who didn't even show up to the showings that we were supposed to get a glimpse of what dragons were going to participate. No, no, no. That's not enough for this most Mary Sue of Mary Sues. She gets two dragons. The second being a feather tail, a type which they don't have a record of bonding with anyone. Kind of throwing that underdog thing under the bus and backing over it a few times when you give her two dragons, especially one the size of her mother's, and one that nobody knows anything about. There are efforts, which are really pretending, to make it look like Violet is at a disadvantage. But hunky love interests A and B just sweep all problems aside, and all chances for real growth are gone. Yeah, I get it. It's a trope. Mid-girl has to pick between two big strong men who are willing to throw away everything for her for some reason. To be fair, love interest B probably has the best claim. I think his name was Dane. Regardless, that's what I'm calling him. Dane is Violet's childhood friend. Her best friend, if you asked her. And she's always had a crush on him. 
until he made something of himself and makes a move on her. Then she's just a dead fish. <laughs> I used to wonder what gave some corners of the internet such a negative view on women. And then I read this book. It's almost like a pickup artist from YouTube wrote it to make women look bad. And just as if that same fictitious pickup artist wrote it, Violet gets all hot and bothered for love interest A, whose name is Zayden. I'm not going to try his last name. He's the son of a rebel lord, and he's covered in tattoos. He's got a screw you attitude, and he's all dark and broody. His tattoos do have some narrative reason behind them, and I'm well aware of what it is. But we all know what they're actually supposed to be. They're tattoos. Because he's the bad boy. So what are these two boys like? What makes them different? Nothing, really. Their whole personalities are, I love Violet, and I'm the best, except for Violet. I honestly don't understand how Violet and Dane are friends. She treats him like crap throughout the whole book. She actually tells him, and this is a quote, It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what I think. There's other context around this statement, but it doesn't actually make it better. Violet's just using Dane. She says she cares for him, but really, she's just using him. There are worse people in the book than Violet and her two boy toys. Let's talk about Jack, the Disney villain. Jack has a complete, irrational hatred of Violet. Why? No idea. I'm sure it's explained in the book, but the reason didn't leave an impression on me. What did leave an impression on me are the multiple people he threw off a bridge into the midair to die in an attempt to kill Violet at the beginning his constant and open threats to kill her, and when he attacks her on his dragon at the end. In fact, there's a scene where Jack is one of Violet's challengers, and she hits him with something he's allergic to. But everyone goes on about how he was trying to kill her, and not the fact that she tried to kill him. Jack, in the story, appears to only have two reasons to exist. To give Violet someone to occasionally humiliate, and to be stupidly evil and also for the author to use the word balls. The man has no other thoughts or emotions than I want to kill Violet. By the end of the book, I sympathized with him. She's absolutely the worst. But she's got plot armor measured in meters, so maybe Jack, just let her be. On that note, the character work in this book is atrocious. All I really got was Violet is selfish, Zayden is a broody simp, Dane is Zayden but not as handsome, and Jack is a psychopath. Last point. The sex scenes in this book are awful. This is coming from someone who doesn't pursue the genre, mainly because I don't like to read or watch other people's bedroom activities. Don't get me wrong, the plot of this book is on the level of adult movies. It's just the adult movies aren't as uncomfortable. It makes me wonder if Yaros and Aster, the person who wrote the last book I reviewed, have ever actually had relations of any kind. I don't want to knock what people enjoy, but there is not this much talking during sex. If you're boring your partner to the point of conversation, maybe it's time to read a book on the subject, and certainly not this one. So let's get into my thoughts. I've been asking myself how stuff like this in Light Lark get published. From what I understand, both have large followings on TikTok. It's disappointing that the only qualification the publishing industry has these days is, do you have enough followers? I made a point to a friend that it's a wonder there are people who read. Almost all the books I've picked from the top seller list are bad to the point of unreadability. This isn't a why don't they approach more indies moment. I know why they do it. Marketing is expensive, and it's great when you can skip it all by publishing somebody with a built-in audience. This book wasn't as bad as Nightbane, but that's like saying leprosy isn't as bad as cancer. These books remind me of the books put out by politicians that nobody reads but somehow sells a million copies. There's something for a fan to get and to wave around for their friends and say, look, I'm part of the club. As far as thoughts on the book, it was predictable, basic, and worst of all, boring. Next week, I'm reviewing Starship Troopers. Good luck, everyone.